Hello and welcome to Bottom Line, your good governance and enlightenment campaign talk show. Tonight we will talk to household name, a woman with many hearts, and we'll be following her journey in the last three decades. The name is Dr. Sylvia Olainka Blyden, and she is my studio guest. A lot has been either said or rumored, either openly or in the corners, about her personality, ranging from allegations of her unstable political standing to her being a propagandist, a member, and or sympathizer of the Revolutionary United Front Party, or RUF. Well, tonight, Dr. Blyden will clarify these assumptions and tell us the bottom line of her philosophy, all on this program, Bottom Line. You too can have your say on our Facebook page at SBC TV channel 31 or by SMS to 030022 639. The number again 030022 My name is Joseph Ebenda Kapua. started. Good evening, Madam Sylvia Olainka Blyden, and welcome to the SLBC. Good evening, and thank you for having me, Joseph. Um, I want to start off by saying I'm very grateful for the very instantaneous response you gave me when I reached out to you that I need to speak to Sierra Leoneans, and I believe the best medium for me to break my silence is the national public broadcaster and i want to tell the people of sierra leone that i called you on a sunday and i just said to you i want to break my silence i want to talk and immediately you said that's why we have a national broadcaster and you're welcome at any time so i want to say thank you for hosting me and thank you for not even hesitating to welcome me on the broadcaster thank you we are happy that you agreed to you know be here because a lot of people will want to understand your position on certain issues and maybe you can offer uh, us an insight into your journey uh, so far but i don't know how to address you or rather how i should address you Am I talking to Sylvia Blyden, the medical doctor? Sylvia Blyden, the journalist, the media owner? Am I seeing Dr. Blyden, the internet cafe owner? Am I seeing the experienced webmaster, the political party leader? Am I seeing Dr. Blyden, the former special executive assistant to former president Kuruma and former minister? Am I Senator Blyden, the bona fide member of the All People's Congress? How would you prefer to be addressed? Um, for tonight, I am here as a politician. I'm here as a member of the All People's Congress. I'm here as a member of, as a female politician who has been harassed and told all types of things. And um, I would prefer you leave out all the internet, media practitioner, medical doctor, which are all... It's a conflict of designations, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just, just call me a female politician all right. from the main opposition, APC. Now, what is your personal philosophy, doctor? I mean, what guides your daily and political life? Well, in politics, as in every aspect of my life, I live by the golden rule, which is do unto others as you wish others to do unto you. That's like, it, it encompasses everything about how I practice my politics. So, and that's why you would not see me in what we would call Dakar Decay politics, where I'm not straightforward, I'm not honest, I'm not upfront. You will never see me in that. What you see is what you get with Sylvia Blyden in politics. I'm very straightforward and I treat other people exactly as I want them to treat me. At any point, can we separate the personal from the public life and philosophy? I have been able to do that quite well. <laughs> um, a lot of people know my public life, a lot of people know my political life. 
they don't know much about my personal private life and um, that's I'm very thankful to God for that that I've been able to manage to effectively manage and separate my public persona from my private personal life. Is there a like heritage influence and lineage of thinking and probably acting in the way uh, we have come to know Dr. Sylvia Olenka Blight in old to see her mind and all of this? <laughs> uh, most definitely. Um, I come from a family of, come from, in fact, from two powerful families that are political families, and um, both from my mother's side and from my father's side. And fortunately, both of my parents, they brought me up in a manner where they made me become very courageous, very bold, and believing first and foremost that for as long as you believe in God, don't ever be afraid of man. So I grew up in a family where I was emboldened. I was sure that the only person you have to be afraid of is God, nothing else. And because I come from a long line of politicians, I come from a very long line of politicians, not just in Sierra Leone, but in Liberia, in the Virgin Islands, we I come from a very political family. I have that confidence that my ancestors have done it before. There's nothing stopping me from also doing it. So it shows in the way I come across very bold and very courageous. It is part of my lineage. Um, let's talk about your student days. From your student days to being special executive assistant and later cabinet minister, has there been a change? I mean, if so, what may have influenced the change? Sylvia has always been Sylvia. From, from the time I was a student politician, I started politics, active politics as a student leader. And the Sylvia you see today is the same Sylvia that my colleagues saw leadership potential in me and elevated me to become the first woman to be elected and win an election as a student union president. It's the same person you see sitting across from you. I have not changed. What I stood for back then is exactly what I still stand for. And if you allow me, I would just give like a summary of what I have been on politically since I was born. Little yeah, we, we, we will get there. I mean, it's talking about student activism. Um, what informed that activism, your student activism and engagement in student politics, uh, as a matter of fact, because that is something unusual for medical students. <laughs> it's true, that is quite true. Um, I think politics is in my DNA. It's, it's a part of me. You, you read up my history. I come from a family of presidents. I have two ancestors who were presidents of Liberia. Wow. I have an ancestor who was vice president of Liberia. I have an ancestor who wanted to be president of Sierra Leone. Uh, so I've, I've come from lineage of political leaders. So it's part of my DNA, I think. It's instinctive. And then there's something about me that my peers normally see as someone who can lead them. So that gravitates them to see me as a potential leader. And that happened when I was in college. I never imagined to be student in a president. It's so interesting wow. how it happened. Yeah, I never, never imagined it. We had someone who was a student union president. He's currently working at the military brigadier general for the SAR. Okay. He was the president of our student union. And um, we also had, uh, and he appointed me as one of his ministers. So he appointed me as his minister. I think I was minister of foreign affairs. And um, then he handed over to another gentleman who is now working at the CDC in America, Dr. Desmond Williams. He was the next student's president, and he also appointed me as one of his ministers. Now, we were at a party, at a college party, and um, Wilshire Johnson, you know, the famous politician yeah. Wilshire Johnson, his son was a medical student. And Sapotekui, another uh, famous, coming from a famous political family, Sapakiwa, and a group of them, they come to me and they say, uh, Sylvia, um, we want to make you our next president. Wow. So I burst out laughing. It was a party. And I said, well, now don't drunk, eh? You know, I was laughing and telling them, you've had too much to drink. Because never before has a woman been a student union president in the entire history of Sierra Leone. 
So he said, no, we have not, we have not come to do it. We are not drunk. We want you. We've seen leadership in you and we've decided. These were all men. We've decided we want you to be the next president of Students' Union. And that's how it started. They wow. gave me a nickname of Margaret Thatcher. She was then a prime minister. Um, they gave me a nickname and they created this campaign mechanism and that was it. That's how I became student union president. Contested against four men and then the men started dropping off. Two of them dropped off. So they don't want a woman to beat them. Yeah. <laughs> so as the first female uh, president, you know, at the College of Medicine, I mean, you just mentioned. Is that where the fire in you, you know, started burning for a political career? Um... I would imagine so because yeah. obviously my colleagues saw something in me yeah. that made them tell me we want you and they campaigned for me they created the strategy everything and i became the senior president it wasn't easy it wasn't smooth because um we reached a point where some of the young men on campus said oh their fathers are laughing at them in the house how can a woman be your president go impeach that woman wow. so they tried to impeach me and um, it was i learned a lot in the process and I became uh, politically minded. And it has been a non-stop because the time I was in college was a pivotal period in Sierra Leone's history. What do I mean by pivotal period? This was the time where we were struggling to change from one-party dictatorship to multi-party democracy. Okay. And we had this fantastic head of state, His Excellency, the late former president, Joseph Saigomo. He was a listening president. So he listened to the cry of the people. And he had an attorney general at the time, Dr. Abdullah Conte. I was politically conscious. And right next door to the College of Medicine campus, we had a, a, a political journalist called Franklin Bontin Davis. And he was a friend of my dad. And I would leave campus, I would go to Franklin Bontin Davis, sit with him, he had a newspaper called New Shaft, help him to edit New Shaft as a college student, and agitate for multi-party democracy. So I was in there when we changed from one-party state to multi-party democracy. That is why I'm one of the few Sierra Leoneans who can quote off-head sections of the 1991 constitution without winking my eyes. I was part of it. I was there. Right. We did the 1991 constitution. So I know everything about the process, what happened, and I also know what, what we wanted as citizens what okay. we wanted in 1991 and what president momo gave to us yeah you're part of a political party then of course i was of the all people's congress party everybody then was a member of the all people's congress party but in my own case i was particularly so because since i was born i was apc how today before i came on this uh, program I saw a news report in the awareness and email box from Addis Ababa. And it says the uh, Sierra Leone ambassador to Addis Ababa, um, who happens to be one of my regent family, um, Ambassador Adekunle King. And the current foreign minister, um, Professor David J. Francis, the foreign minister, that the two of them had succeeded in convincing Nigeria to step down for Sierra Leone to now be the sole candidate from West Africa to sit on the United Nations Security Council. And I was like, what a coincidence. Because one of the things that I was going to speak about today is what happened on October 1st, 1971, the day I was born. I say I was APC since the day I was born, and I was, I'm very specific and I'm very deliberate when I say that. Because on the day I was born, my grandfather, my mother's father, Solomon A.J. Pratt, was the foreign minister of Sierra Leone. And using his skills, he was, a he was an international diplomat before he worked for the UN as an international diplomat. He was able to get Sierra Leone so positioned internationally that we were on the United Nations Security Council. And not only that, Sierra Leone held the chairmanship of the United Nations Security Council in 1971. Very few people know this. I know, and why do I know? 
On the day I was born, October 1st, 1971, my grandfather was addressing the United Nations because at that time, since Sierra Leone was the sole African seat on the United Nations Security Council, my grandfather was a de facto spokesman for what was known as the Group of 77. Sierra Leone held the position, the very powerful position on the United Nations as the spokesperson speaking for every single suppressed voice in Africa, Namibia, Nelson Mandela, Swapo, Rhodesia, all of these people, my grandfather was basically like their spokesman. And most importantly, he was also the spokesman for China. Sierra Leone was the spokesperson speaking on behalf of this all-powerful China today in 1971. And on the day I was born, October 1st, 1971, my grandfather was on the podium as the chairman of the UN Security Council and the Sierra Leone, because he represented President Shaka Stevens at the UN General Assembly debate. And he was speaking passionately for Swapo, Namibia, because all of these countries back then were so Bangladesh, all of these countries back then were suppressed. They didn't have a voice. They were either under colonial masters. And after giving a powerful speech, he came up to the podium and he was met, he was then the foreign minister. He was met by the ambassador, who was then Taylor Kamara, and the head of Chansky, Kuzvi Taylor, with a telegram. A baby CBI was born? Yes, yes. And he, they gave him the, in those days, we didn't have telephones, we didn't have fax, we didn't have, the way they communicate yeah. is by telegram. So they said to him, Mr. Minister, he has a telegram. And he opens his telegram, and what's in the telegram? That he has a second granddaughter, and they give the time that granddaughter was born. And I was born at the time my grandfather was agitating for China, Namibia, Swapo, and all of those things. So my grandfather wrote a telegram back to Freetown. And he said, this girl is going to be a special girl in Sierra Leone. Get her an APC membership card immediately. Wow. So I have been an APC member since the day I was born. All right. Okay, that's clear. Now let's look at another aspect. Your affiliation or alleged affiliation with the... Um, Revolutionary United Front, uh, the RUF. I mean, the allegations that um, you are very close to uh, the leader of that um, movement, the Revolutionary United Front, that's the late um, um, Fode Sebana Sanko, and that in fact your sister um, was secretary to him. How would you respond insofar as that affiliation is concerned? Even call it as if you are more or less a surrogate to the um, RUF leadership. Well, you see, you hear all these stories, but you never see anything tangible that is evidence that shows that Sylvia was a member of the AGF or Sylvia was close to Fodi Sanko. You never see any evidence. You hear these, these vague allegations out there. They are thrown out there to derail my political ambitions. It started off with, uh, it was a journalist. A lot of people sometimes say, why is Sylvia so passionate about these criminal libel laws and saying that they should not remove the criminal libel laws? It is the experience I went through. There was this journalist called Udu Godin. Yeah, terrible, Udu terrible Richie. man. He's a, a horrible man. That and, is Richie Udu Godin. Uh, yes, yes. He was a terrible, horrible fellow. And um, in 1995, when I was student leader in Sierra Leone, I wrote to the United Nations Secretary General asking for sponsorship to attend the Beijing Conference on Women. Because for the first time the world was going to have a conference where women were coming from all over the world to discuss the issues of women's rights. Women's rights were human rights. I wanted to discuss what, how women get advanced. My mother was a permanent secretary. At that time she was the permanent secretary for the Ministry of Social Welfare. I was a student president in my own right. And I wrote a letter to the United Nations asking for financial support. Through, there was a lady who was then the UNDP uh, resident representative. She was called Elizabeth Luanga. And I wrote to Elizabeth Luanga on my College of Medicine letterhead saying I'm the first woman to be elected a student president 
in the entire history of Sierra Leone, and I went to attend the Beijing Conference on Women. The U.S. Secretary General at the time was Butros Butros Gali. Butros Butros Gali replied back to Lisbeth Luanga to finance me to go to China, to go to the Beijing Conference on Women. I go to the Beijing Conference on Women, and my mother happens to be the Permanent Secretary for Ministry of Social Welfare. So she also has to go in her capacity as a Permanent Secretary for Social Welfare. And Richie Olu Gordon, not knowing anything about how I got my financial support, how I went to China, started writing in his newspaper that why should the Blydens take all the positions, all the slots, and go to China, and he was just writing and writing and writing. So he had this issue with me since 1995. When I became, when I came back from China, and I actively said that I am going to be president of Sierra Leone one day, no matter what is written about me in the newspapers. Because at the time I was still in the president, I was always in the media, I was being interviewed on the BBC and stuff. Then Richard Olgodin wrote in his newspaper, and I have that newspaper up to today, that I will be president over his dead body. So Richie Olgodin is the person who activated, promoted, and wrote all those horrible stories about Sylvia, because it was the war years, and the first thing that dies is the truth. But as I sit here today, I challenge anybody to show me any evidence of me, Sylvia Blyden, being a member of the RUF, of me being close to Fode Sanko, of me being, uh, because in fact now what they say, they say I was a founding member of the RUF. Uh, <laughs> yes, we hear that. Yeah. So how can I be a founding member of the RUF in 1991, when I was in Freetown, a student, in the College of Medicine here in Freetown? Okay. It's impossible. Yes, Doc. Um, the but, allegations... But, no, no, let me, let me... The allegations, I mean, you, you, you make those clarifications, I mean, when you get it. We just want to see if we can tie it with this uh, bit of it. Because, um, yes, you've made a point. These allegations continue but people are yet to come out with um, tangible evidence to substantiate all this. There remain allegations, but there are so many, and the assumptions are so many. Uh, what was that? Um, you were also responsible for operating the, they call it the Ninja website? And all that, that, is, that is... Is that where you developed the interest um, um, in the media and started probably even publishing, if so? No, I, I already told you about Franklin Bunton Davis yeah. from 1989. His, his office was right yeah, next to... Edit, yeah. His office was right next to the College of Medicine. This was 1989. He had a newspaper called New Shaft. In 1991, when Kingsley LinkedIn and uh, Tony Hesmat, these were two Nigerians, they were working in Liberia, and um, the war in Liberia drove them to Sierra Leone, and they opened up, they came, and they opened up a new media, they called it the Concord Times. I was one of their shadow editors. I was then in medical school. I was one of the shadow editors at Concord Times. You can ask Kingsley. Tony is no longer in active journalism. Kingsley now works at the United Nations. He was here recently for the... Um, you said it's Concord some, Times? He owned it. He owns yes, it. It was Concord Times. And I was one of the shadow editors at Concord Times. They, they all know that. At, I was part and parcel of Concord Times. I was a medical student. I was with New Shaft. I was a medical student. I was with Kingsley and Tony. So me being associated with journalism has been like this all my life. But coming back to your issue of Ninja, I don't know what people believe or think about Ninja, but what I know was Ninja was the national independent neutral journalist association that is NINGA that's ninja that's what i knew for ninja and i know that ninja was formed by a group of journalists inside Sierra Leone after the then government said that no journalist can publish any news report without being vetted by the ministry of information so there's a statement that is online up to today. It was issued, and I know the date, on the 15th of December, 1998, saying that we are journalists who cannot practice our profession by submitting our work to be edited first and approved and vetted before we publish. So that's, that's my understanding of how Ninjas was formed. But because these journalists could not show their identities, 
inside Sierra Leone at the time, they kept themselves anonymous. Just in the same way that the then Minister of Information had kept himself anonymous while he was running 98.1. Now, the only connection that you put between these journalists inside Sierra Leone, because at the time I wasn't in Sierra Leone, I was in America. I was then living in America. The only connection you put between these journalists and Dr. Sylvia Blyden is the fact that Dr. Sylvia Blyden was advocating that these journalists are correct to go underground. They value their lives. They don't want to be killed. So they were right here in Freetown, and they were filing reports from Freetown. And I'm in America, and I'm saying they have a right to be able to run their news reports without being vetted. That's the only connection that they would give you. But let me tell you what is the closest and this tonight is going to be the first time I'm going to tell the people of Sierra Leone why President Kaba, until the day he died, he had tremendous respect for me. So for the first time today, I'm going to explain to Sierra Leoneans, and with your permission, if you allow me time, because this is something that Sierra Leoneans are going to learn for the first time today, and you patiently allow me to just take my time and explain to them so that they can understand how some issues came about and the role I played in the peace process. Before we come to the peace process, Doug, I mean, we'll come to your role, if not only for the peace process, but I mean, generally as a Sierra Leonean and the, the role they have played in that regard. I mean, we'll come to that bit. Just trying to exhaust these bits, these allegations. Or well, that's, that's, about that's, that's, that's key. This is yeah. what I want to take my time to explain now. It's key for people to understand what was happening back then. And why is it that we are at a situation now where people are saying, oh, Sylvia was a friend to Fodi Sanko. When, how could I be a friend to Fodi Sanko? Or yeah. Sylvia was an IUF member. How could I be a member was of your sister area? was secretary? Oh. That is what they say. I am not aware of this. You see, these are things that they say, these are stories that they, they float out there. What I'm aware of is what I can see. What I know is that I was in America and I'm told that, oh, there was an uh, uh, issue at Fodi Sanko's house and they're rounding up people in the same way they were rounding up people before. And I hear that my sister was supposed to be one of those they round up and then they release her. But as far as I know, and up to today, I'm not aware of my sister being for the Sankos secretary. Okay. And I'm wondering, how would my sister be for the Sankos secretary? You see, these are things they float, they put out there. You're trying to justify why you're calling Sylvia a rebel. <laughs> you say, so oh, Ellen's sister said, I mean, secretary to right, we'll come to the, 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 your role in the peace process. But then again, what is the talk between you and the AFRC as rumored? And the reports suggest you had a relationship with the AFRC because you appointed Deputy Minister of Health and that even at some point AFRC? you yes, I mean that's what we read around, that's what people say. Actually, that's this what is the first rumor. time I'm hearing that word. Yeah, that you are even Deputy Minister of of Health and that you even took Johnny Paul Kroma at some point on a visit to Connaught Hospital. Well, first of all, I mean, it's complete nonsense that I was minister on the air policy. Complete nonsense. I wasn't in Sierra Leone. I was in America the entire time. The only time I came to Sierra Leone, I came to change my visa from, because I went to uh, uh, America as a, a visitor. And I, I engaged at Kaplan University to do my medical license board. And I came to, do my, to change my visa, and I crossed over to Sierra Leone. That's the only time I can you know a matter of few days. And when I was coming, the then director general, well, it wasn't called director, I think it was it called director general of SLBC, SLBS, uh, yes, Jipu Felix George, was, was that his? Director general. Director general. Yes, because the last director general of the SLBS was Gina Banda Thomas. Yeah, no, this was Jipu Felix George. Yes, he must have been the, the So Jipu Felix George was like an uncle. And everybody is worried about, they have these Nigerian alpha jets, they come in, they're throwing bombs, and um, everybody's worried, how do, does this peace process go? So I'm coming to change my visa from a uh, visitor's visa to student visa in oh, Guinea yeah. Conakry. And Uncle Jipu says to me, uh, Sylvia, but I have these skills. It's nothing I trained for, how to develop websites. It's a skill I have. He says, if you can assist the SLBS, yes. not SLBC, SLBS, I 
have his emails up to now and so we created a website called www.slbs.net if you check the records for that domain name you would see jipu philip george was the owner and the technical person was sylvia blyden so slbs.net was the website that uncle jipu had me create for the slbs okay. so the that was during the time now they wanted, I mean, everybody wants peace process, everybody wants the peace to start. President Tijan Kaba then was in Guinea, but he had signed something called the Conakry Peace Accord, where they gave dates and times for everybody to come back to Sierra Leone and have the peace process. So Uncle Jipu was saying to me, help me out, let's have SABS, SABS yes, yeah. um, news online. Yes. So I worked with Uncle Jipu on creating SABS.net. That's the nearest you can connect me to the air farms. That's the nearest. Everything else they are telling you is so nonsense. If there's ever, I don't remember any such occasion of going with Johnny Paul to Connors Hospital, but if anything like that happened, maybe I would probably have been with Uncle Jipu during the time that he's doing the SABS.net for a few days. Because when I came for, to do my visa changing, I came to Uncle Jipu here at the SABS and spent a few days here to get their SABS.net website working before I went back to America. So that would be the only window for the aspect of being Deputy Minister under AFS. It's rubbish. <laughs> These are all rubbish. These are all false allegations. These are all bogus allegations that are brought forward by people who they want to stop my political career. They want to stop my speed. They say, oh, Sibia, Mago, 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 Mago. They say, they're, not, they're not comfortable with a woman who can last for so long, 30 years now in politics. They're not comfortable with it. All right, let's talk about your role, if any, in the peace process in Sierra Leone. Yeah, it's not a matter of if any, it's major. And as I was saying, this is going to be the first time tonight that I am going to reveal what I'm going to say. One second, let me just want to check them. This is going to be the first time that I'm going to be revealing something that Sierra Leoneans had never known before. If you are just joining us, the program is Bottom Line and it's coming to you from our We Here Broadcasting House, New England, in Freetown. And my guest tonight is Dr. Sylvia Olaika Blyden, female politician, and she's here tonight to talk to us about a few issues and to clarify those issues that have been rumored all over the place and she's here on the SLBC to make those clarifications look um yes um tonight for the very first time one second I'm just looking at one data because I want to be quite specific here you have all the time look yeah. <laughs> Tonight, for the very first time, I'm going to explain to Sierra Leoneans the role that I have played in the peace process for the very first time. Okay, I can't find what I was looking for here, but... Eventually, you'll get I'll probably get to just want to engage us. Yes. It's okay. Um, I'm going to take my time and to Sierra Leoneans today for you to understand. You can see me, I'm dressed here with this flag of Sierra Leone and um, the big epaulet that's here. This is an officer of the Order of the Rokel. Oh, wow. Yes, and this is something that is only given to a selected few Sierra Leoneans who should be of the highest possible honorable character. High pedigree. You don't give this to just anybody. And in my own case, not only was I given a national honor of officer of the order of the Rokel, but I became the youngest person in the entire history of Sierra Leone to be given this honor. And it was done by the head of state because only the head of state has the power to give a national honor to somebody. So the question is, this head of state who gave me this honor, His Excellency Alaji, Dr. Ahmad Tijan Kaba, was the same president 
who was being fought by the RUF rebels, and he knows all what the RUF rebels did to him. And yet people keep on saying Sylvia was RUF, Sylvia was for this and cause this and for this and cause uh, and I. So how could Tijan Kabat take this same Sylvia and give her this type of very high opulent, very high honor? And tonight, you need to hear this story. You need to learn and know that the old man wasn't crazy. The old man knew how much I deserve this honor. And I also know that not only do I deserve this honor, but I am one day going to be honored by the people of Sierra Leone, even higher than this one. So tonight, let me tell you this story. It's a story that would start from when I first met President Obasanjo of Nigeria at the time. He had just been released from jail in 1998 in America. In 1998 in America, we had Sierra Leoneans, a group of us who believed in working for peace in Sierra Leone. And we would regularly meet and we would meet with the Nigerians who were fighting General Abacha. Because General Sani Abacha was suppressing Nigeria. He was a horrible dictator and he was suppressing Nigeria. But he was backing President Kaba in Sierra Leone as a means of cleaning up his image and pretending he's a Democrat. So there were a group of us, and I will name some of them tonight. I would name the leader, the then main opposition leader, who was in exile because he could not come back to Sierra Leone as he was afraid for his life, Dr. John Karifa Smart. He was the leader of the UNPP, which was the largest opposition party in Sierra Leone. I would name the current Speaker of Parliament, the Right Honorable Dr. Abbas Cherinobundu. He was then the leader of the PPP party. I would name the Honorable Edward M. Toure. He was then the leader of the All People's Congress, the APC. All of these people were in exile in America. I was also in America. I would regularly meet with the Nigerians during the time Apacha was alive. At this time, Obasanjo was in jail. He was a political prisoner. When Abacha died, Obasanjo was released from jail, and he was invited to come to America to meet the Nigerian activists who had been working for his release, agitating for democracy to return to Nigeria. And Obasanjo asked to meet the Sierra Leoneans who were also working with these Nigerians. By some coincidence, all of these names I had called, we all used to work together. They somehow forgot to tell me the exact time that we should meet with Obasanjo. So Obasanjo met with nine, between nine to 10 powerful civilian leaders. All of these people, Abbas Bundu, Khalifa Smart, Eddie Toure, Alma Misila. He also came here and formed the political party of his own. Honorable Bosco, Ibrahim Bundu. Um, who became majority leader here. He was also in exile in, Amer in America at the time. And Obasanjo met them. But something interesting happened at that meeting. They were complaining about tribalism of the SLPP, all of them. And Obasanjo asked each of them at the table, what were their tribes? And one after the other, each of them said, I'm a timini, I'm a timini, I'm a timini, I'm a timini. And then Obasanjo asked the question, how many tribes are in Sierra Leone? And they said 17 tribes. So that was the, basically the end of the meeting. So the Nigerian activists called me that evening and said to me, Dr. Blyden, why did you not attend this meeting today? If only you had attended, it would have neutralized the perception that it's just two tribes in Sierra Leone fighting themselves, the Timini versus the Mede. He said, we want Obasanjo on board. At the time, Obasanjo was just released from prison. He wasn't thinking of being president. And we need you to talk to Obasanjo as somebody from the Western area who is not a Timini. So they connected me to Obasanjo. He had left Washington, D.C. and gone to New York. And they connected me with Obasanjo on the phone. Now, before I spoke to Obasanjo, I did research. I went to the internet. I read up about him. I read up about all his works. 
When I engaged him on the phone on behalf of the Smell Peace issues, I would quote something that he said in 1960, in 1970, in 1980. And he was very amazed that I knew so much about him. And he's thinking that this must be somebody who is in her 50s and 60s who knows all these things that happened. Because I would tell him what he said when Mandela was arrested. I would tell him what was, what did he say? And he was on the phone speaking to me. When he realized I was only 26 years of age on the phone, he immediately called his daughter, she was with him in the room, and he called his son and he says, you have to talk to this girl. She's only 26, she knows about Africa for the last 50 years. He was so impressed. And that was a turning point where I became like a member of his family. My mother at the time was in detention in Sierra Leone Amongst all the permanent sectors who, were, who had been working, she was unfairly detained, all of them were detained. So Obasanjo connected me with Amnesty International and many of these people, because he had also been a political prisoner. And then he gave me his direct line at the house, at his, at his house in Nigeria. And he says to me, keep in touch about your mother's issue. After a few weeks, I called all these people. In fact, he had already called some of them in advance to say, there's this lady from Sierra Leone, you have to help her. After a few weeks, I called at the number he gave to me, and the lady answers the phone. The lady says, hello, and I say, yes, can I speak with the general, General Basanjo? And she says, who is this? And she, you know, she was like, not happy with this person calling, so who is this? So I said, oh, I'm from Sierra Leone, I live in America, and she ended up and said, oh! Are you online, huh? Imagine. I said, yes, ma. He said, oh, I am Mrs. Stella Obasanjo. General, General, your online car has called. That means he had gone home and spoken about me to the wife. And from that moment, myself, the wife, General Obasanjo became very close. They would call me on the phone. If they don't get me, they would leave messages on the phone. And we became close and people knew I was like a part of their family. When he was asked to be president of Nigeria to contest, when people came, he called me in Nigeria and asked me for advice. We were that close. Should I go back into politics? Olenka, what do you think? We were that close. And I said, why not? If you become president of Nigeria, my uncle is president of Nigeria, why not? And I supported him. He had no money. This is the interesting thing. Nigerians pumped in money to make him president. The support I gave to him was to open up a website called www.obasanjo.com and myself and the wife ran the www.obasanjo.com website. One week to the Nigerian elections, and this is the point I want Syrianians to listen to because this shows you when that this was a spiritual world. When God wants some things to happen, it happens according to how God dictates it. One week to the Nigerian elections in 1999, the early 1999, Auntie Stella calls me, his wife, his, and they need some data to be put on the website very, very urgently for certain strategic reasons. They need this data. But this data was in a book called Letters to Obasanjo that was in Nigeria. There was a lady in New York who had this book and they asked me to ask the lady so that I can get the book and take the contents and put it on the obasanjo.com website. Unfortunately, she searched and she couldn't find the book. And then Auntie Stella calls and says, Benga has just told us he has a copy. Who is Benga? Obasanjo's son, his son who was a medical doctor living in Baltimore. From my house to Baltimore is about an hour and a half drive. I come, jump into my car call Benga, say I'm coming on the way, I'm coming to pick up on Kulu's book letters of us. I go up there, me and him will have dinner, pick the book. I'm driving back down to my house in Maryland. My cousin calls me on the phone. My cousin called Elaine, she was called Elaine Gaba. Elaine calls me on the phone and she has been, by coincidence, just as I was driving from Baltimore to get to Maryland, Around the point where you can bend into Virginia, she was living in Virginia, is when she calls me. And she says, hey, Doc, hey, from when you say they can't visit this new boyfriend. She had a new guy she was dating, 
and she wanted me to meet this new boyfriend who came from London. So I said, okay, I'm tired, I just came from Baltimore, and I swerved the car, I turned my car around to go back to visit Elaine. Because of the importance of the book, I did not leave it in the vehicle. I held the book in my hand and I walked into Elaine's house. I enter Elaine's house and I said, yes, Bola, can I be this boyfriend? I, you know, I said, Let me know this, this new guy you have, she wanted me to meet this guy. And she introduces me to this guy. First time I was meeting him. Who was this guy? Oluni Robin Coker. I knew the name Robin Coker, but I could not figure out who really he was. I had had the name before. And Elaine introduces me to Oluni. She says, oh, this is my boyfriend. And so I'm holding this book. So Elaine has listened. I'm holding this book up, Obasanjo, letters to Obasanjo. And I'm explaining that, oh, I just came from Obasanjo's son. I have to go put the information in this book into the obasanjo.com website. And Oluni has tons, and I could see he's interested, and he's like, do you know Obasanjo? Because at that time, Obasanjo was the leading presidential candidate. The elections had not yet been held. He said, do you know Obasanjo? I said, yeah, I know him very, very well. He's like my uncle. I'm part of their family. And he was like, hmm? I said, yeah. I said, I can even play you messages on my phone. So, you know, just, yeah. I'm 20 something years old, just. So I play my voicemail, and they hear Obasanjo calling to check on me, Obasanjo's wife calling to check on me, and uh, say, yes, I'm part of their family. I say, if they win election, I don't get election. How so, would you link this to the so, process, the peace process? That's what, itself, I mean, that's, that's, that's where we're coming to. So I think as I said, um, the, the, if the, they win the elections next week, that's where he's the president, is my uncle, who become president of Nigeria. So I notice he's interested, we talk, and I go back home. The elections are held within a week. I put up the information on the website. And the results are announced. Obasanjo had a landslide victory of 60 something percent. His closest rival had like 30 something percent. The very next day, my cousin calls me, Elaine. And she says, um, Sylvia Olumi wants to talk to you. I say, oh, okay, what is it about? So I talk to him. So Olumi comes on the phone. And he says to me, Sylvia, you are going to have to save Sierra Leone. I said, hmm? <laughs> How? He said, the peace process is stalled in Sierra Leone. And my friend and brother, Omri Goli, has met the Americans, the State Department. He has met the London uh, Whitehall. He has met the ECOWAS Secretary General. But everybody says the peace in Sierra Leone is in the hands of Olusegu Nobasanjo. But unfortunately, because you know, ECOMOG was then controlling Sierra Leone. But unfortunately, everybody has tried for this, my friend of Goli, to speak to Obasanjo, and we have not been able to meet Obasanjo. He's now the president elect. I know, I have listened to the voice messages, I have seen that you are close to them. Is there any way you can get us to talk to Obasanjo? Because he is going to hold the key to the peace process. Now, Obasanjo is president-elect, and I wouldn't just give access to anybody like that. So I call him. I always call him Uncle Olu. And I explained to him, I said, these people say there's a problem. The peace process, ECOWAS is on board. State Department is on board. The London is on board. But there's a challenge they need to speak to you because you have control of the entire Nigerian so there's in Sierra yeah. Leone at the time. So they need to speak to you so that you can understand what is happening. And he says, um, peace process in Sierra Leone. I say, yes, on Golo. And then I say to him, when, because when, when you, have, he, you have different people helping him to become president, and my own role was helping with the website, the Obasanjo.com website. I said, Uncle Lou, the way you can help me, according to what I have been told, the peace process in Sierra Leone would surely work if you, as the Nigerian head of state, can convince Tijan Kaba about the need to get proper dialogue with all warring factions. But at that time, it wasn't just the RAF. You also had the West Side Boys. Okay. You had the, you had different groups. 
So then he says to me, don't give them my direct line. What I can do for you? Put them on the phone and give your phone to them to, them to talk to me. But don't give them my direct line. So I call Oluni and I say, Oluni, well, you're lucky. Uncle Olu says he will talk to you, people. But unfortunately, I cannot give you his number, his direct line. He talks to you on your phone. So the only way you can talk to me him is on the phone. And he says, oh, Omri is in Europe, in Macedonia, Croatia. Joseph, I had to take my own money, my phone, to make an international call. And it was so expensive that back then to Macedonia, get Omri on the phone. I had never met him in my life, but only introduces me to him on the phone. I had to make an international phone call to Macedonia. And then Omri is on the line. Then I call Uncle Olu in Nigeria, and then I do a three-way call for them to talk. Well, that's the only condition on that which Sandu will talk to them, if I connect them and give them my phone to speak with. So I am on the line, and I'm listening to all the challenges. Omri takes all his time, and he was quite convincing, and Oba Sandu was writing down all the notes, all the concerns, all the challenges for the peace process. And then Obasanjo says to Omri, yes, the ECOWAS Secretary General, because at that time was a Secretary General ECOWAS Harry. The ECOWAS Secretary General had informed me, but this wasn't a priority. But the way you have explained to me, and for the sake of Sylvia, I am going to make this one of my top priority. Immediately I am sworn in as president. That is the nearest that you can connect me to Aliyev. Because then Obasanjo says to Omri Gori, give me a few days, after I've investigated all these points, I will talk to my daughter, because he used to call me daughter, and the line car will get back to you. Because he never wanted me to give his direct line to Omri. And that's why you know, I'm naming all these names today for the first time for people to understand where all of these the nearest that comes to the peace process and Sylvia. After a few days, Uncle calls me. He says, connect me with the gentleman for the peace process. I have spoken to so, so, and so person. So I connect him again, three way call again. And I became the in person now who, Obasanjo knew I would never release his direct line. When he changes his, di his direct line, he gives, them, he gives his direct line to me. And I connect Omri Goli. And eventually, Omri, Obasanjo, Tijankaba, Ekowas had a perfect understanding for the peace process to go on. But if I had not been in that position at that particular point in time to facilitate that the, 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 the conduit in all of this. Yeah, if I had not been the conduit, if I had not been there, only God knows where the peace process would have gone. Because it is a fact that Obasanjo's insistence on peace for Sierra Leone delivered peace for Sierra Leone. And without me, where would the peace have been? That is the nearest. I am revealing this for the first time tonight because these are things that all of these names have named the no. This is the nearest you can facilitate, you can connect me to Ariel. But it gets even more intriguing, even more intriguing. After the Lome Peace Accord had been signed, because first they had the Lome um, ceasefire agreement that was in immediately after Obasanjo became president, he was sworn in as president in May of 1998. Immediately after he ensured there was a ceasefire, he got the rebels to sign a ceasefire, he got Jankaba to sign a ceasefire, and May 25, 1999, there was a ceasefire. So they had the ceasefire agreement signed. Then subsequent to that, now they had the Lume Peace Accord in July. And for me, I'm fine, I'm done with that. I've connected these people, I'm very happy, we have peace. The Lume Peace Accord has been signed. And I'm in America, sometime in August. I was at Estella who calls me, Obasanjo's wife. And she says, there seems to be a, pro a problem with the peace process in Sierra Leone. She says, they've signed the peace accord, everything, but it's like the, for, for them to go back to Sierra Leone, 
one of the men is protesting that he will not go back. So I said, what man is this? So well, I don't know, but if you talk to your uncle, he'll be able to explain to you. So that's Andrew explains to me that this was now John Okorowa. Johnny Paul had all his people, including his wife, in Kailau, virtually under captivity. He had been set free as part of all these negotiations, the Lome peace, and everything. He had been released to go to Lome after the West Side Boys had agitated. And he was made some kind of something commission for peace, some type yeah. of title. But for them to go back, to come to Sierra Leone, to start the peace process, they to protested. start the, he said he would not go. Now, at that time, he was in Lome or, no, he was in Liberia. They had not come to Liberia, but to move from Liberia now to come to Sierra Leone, he protested that he would not go until those his people are released from Buedu Kailamu. So America and Antistella calls me and she tells me, and I speak to President Obasanjo and he's like saying that there's a stalemate. Can you go down to Liberia and find out what is the real issue? I trust whatever you will tell me because I'm getting mixed signals. This person is saying this, this person is saying that, this person is saying this. Joseph, it was selfless service to the peace process in Sierra Leone. My birthday, my, birthday was, my birthday was coming up on October 1st, 1999. I left America, I left birthday celebrations I had planned for myself to come to Liberia on my own accord. When I got to Liberia, met with Johnny Pokoguma, what is the problem? Why have you not, why are you refusing for the peace process? I said, Sylvia, if I go to Freetown and I leave Makuta, that is his wife, in Buedu, and I leave all my APC people, because he had a lot of APC politicians who had been, they were being chased. So they had all run to Kailau. He said, when I get to Freetown, there would be no stake for me to hold for them to be released from Kailau. But if I refuse to go to Freetown until they release them, they would release my wife and they would release all these people. And it makes sense what he was saying. So I sent the feedback again to Nigeria that this, from my own point of view, this is the bottleneck. This man's relatives, his wife, his political figures, they are in Kailau. If they are not released, I don't see him going to Freetown. So Obasanjo now had to get the Nigerian armed forces to get two helicopters to fly from Monrovia to come into Liberia and pick up Johnny Paul Kuruma's wife and all these APC politicians. They hit that through the president then, Amati Jankabar? No, of course. Through the, because, see, what was happening, you were getting different mixed signals. President Kaba was giving his own explanation. The then Liberian president was giving his own explanation. And ECOWAS was giving their own explanation. And President Obasanjo so in, in was... In you got Obasanjo, I mean, to release uh, Johnny Paul's wife? Not Obasanjo to release Johnny Paul's wife. The RUF were the ones who held on to Johnny Paul's wife and the APC politicians in Kailanga. Ah. It, wasn't, it wasn't the Tijan Kaba regime in Freetown. Johnny Paul was basically under kidnap of the RUF at that time in Liberia. He was only released when the West Side Boys protested, and they released only him. But now here's the interesting part. When the helicopters went to pick up this Johnny Paul's wife and these politicians, I didn't know who they were. I just knew that some of them were APC politicians. And so the helicopter comes. Helicopter comes to them, they land. And of course, as they land, they come in my hotel and they tell me, oh, the Nigerian the, uh, um, helicopter has come with these people. And then when I see these people for the first time, guess who are these people? Victor Bokali Fo, W.J. Smith, Cecil Osho Williams, Myla Yansane, Hilton File, the former broadcast journalist. Had it not been for my intervention, they would never have released them for Kailan. They are right. right. I mean, So when they release them, it's, it's, when, when they release them in Liberia, when they, when they release them, 
that is the only way the peace process was now able to start. Because then, there was no excuse for Johnny Paul to say, I'm not going back to free time. I am going to add a designation to uh, the, the the number of designations that I have. I'm going to also call you this, you are the facilitator at some point in the program. But I think you have, you have actually looked at the, the role and the, the significant role probably that you played in that regard. I mean, especially on the, on the notes that the president of Nigeria had to call, you know, um, um, have confidence in all this. Big time confidence. Big time confidence. And, 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 and it was his own. Then, and we, we, that has been established, and I'm sure people now know how it all started, but for that intervention, it would have actually been something difficult to unlock this. Let's talk about the same. It's about you now, having realized your your role, I mean, insofar as the peace process is an issue. Let's talk about your early uh, political leadership. I mean, we, we know you had an early run at leading a political party. We have, was it the YPP or so? The Young People's Party. Yes. yes. What informed that decision, though? It's the same thing like what happened when I was in student, when I was a student leader. I was in America, and um, I get this email from people I had never met in my life. This was in 2001, two years after the peace process, after the No Peace Accord, after the, you know, it was 2001, the country was stabilizing a little bit, political activities was happening. I mean, I, make, I, I was assisting people in Sierra Leone. There are lots and lots of people who, because I was very successful now, I must say that a lot of people who were then in exile in America as Nigerians, a chunk of them went back to Nigeria, contested the elections, and became governors, speakers, parliamentarians, powerful people, senators. And they were giving me a lot of contracts, especially in the area of ICT. So I, I didn't have money shortage. I had money. I would always in Nigeria, uh, different places. You know, I created a company. It was called WestAfrica.net. Registered in Washington DC, London. I, I was. I had money. I wasn't poor by any stand, any stretch of the imagination. I wasn't poor. I had a lot of money, and people knew I had money. So I got this email in 2001 from these Sierra Leoneans. I had never met them. One of them was called Cornelius Devo. Another one was called. You mean the former Deputy Commission Minister? Yes, yes, yes. For the Young People's Congress. Oh yes, he was the chairman of the YPP. Uh. He was the national chairman of the Young People's Party. He actually recruited me to be the uh. YPP leader. Yes. So they send an email and they tell me about how they admire me and they want me to come and lead this political party that has been provisionally registered. How old were you then? 29 years of age. And they wanted you to lead a political party? Yes. And the party was called Young People's Party. They had uh, the late Dr. Alusain Fofana, the husband okay. of Yasmin yeah. Jusu Sharif, was initially working with them as de facto leader. Then uh, Ambassador Joe Black, the then Ambassador, uh, he also was working with the YPP, but these were older men. And um, the young, the youth said, no, we don't want, you want somebody young. So that's how they reached out to me. I was 29 years of age, and they said, we want you. So it's the, in the same way I was identified as a student, as a student yeah. leader, it's the same way Cornelius Dovo, Mark Foy, and all of these people identified me all the way in America, they sent me an email. And they say we are from this party, we had Joe Blair first, we had Alusai Fofana, we don't want them anymore, we want you to lead us. But I don't know these people. Cornelius I knew because his father, his stepfather was a journalist who was close to my own father, who was a civil activist. But I never really knew Cornelius. But um, Cornelius was there, you know, they sent this email. And I was like, ah, ah. come and lead party. At that time I'm APC. Because at that time, we were the backbone of the APC in America. I was spending my money on the APC in America. I had money. So I was spending my money on developing the APC in America. You still have, I would say. No, not well, the kind of money I had back then. I mean, I had money back then. So I was spending my money on developing the APC because this was my party, my grandfather's party, my father's party, my mother's party. And I was spending money on the APC. 1999, 2000, 2001, spent money on the APC in America. So, but at that point, the, by coincidence, the APC got embroiled in big internal fights between Eddie Toure and his Musa Musasuma, 
these guys were fighting them, and I mean big time fight. So initially I rejected Cornelius Dobo and the others. I was like, no, I don't know you people. How can I just be party leader for you guys? I said, no, I'm not interested. So they recruited people to talk to me. And one of them who was able to convince me was Lawrence Santigi Sisi. You must know him, yeah. Ketima. Yeah. Ketima was popular civil society activist, but he was brought up by my mom. My late mother helped to raise him up. So Ketima called me in America and, she, and he, he basically convinced me by saying, believe in these young people. They're credible. Okay. Don't have any doubt in them. I am giving you a guarantee that young people's party he said, because the APC now has also fed fed the inside it. They're not going to solve them problem. But you can come and inspire young Sierra Leoneans to believe that you don't have to get power through the bullet. Okay. You can get power through the box. So that's how I came into right, no, but let's, let's, let's talk about your relationship with the Tijan Kaba, you know, and Bero Aled SLPP. I mean, apart from leading the the YPP at that age and all of those. I mean, your party, like you just mentioned, the APC, was in turmoil. I mean, there was crisis with perpetual leadership, you know, crisis all over the place. But then, unlike the editorials that you just mentioned, you did not stay to fix the APC, but then you, you what one would call, romanticized with the SLPP. You know, and that's that is totally untrue. Say. That is untrue. I'm going to categorically challenge anybody today on air to produce just one SLPP meeting, not even two, not even two, one SLPP meeting, where you have since if you are blinded as an SLPP member, SLPP activist, just one. It's not there. Your, your paper, the Awareness Times uh, newspaper, was more or less a de facto mouthpiece of the Kaba administration and there are, you know, SLPP leadership. That's a lie. I can challenge anybody on that. That's a lie. Awareness Times is a very independent newspaper. The, criti the criticisms of Tijan Kaba that is in Awareness Times is tremendous. I remember one time I went to Pujang and I saw this horrible bridge where vehicles had to travel to enter Pujang town. And the bridge was in such a horrible condition, I was so disgusted. And I took photographs of this horrible condition because, you know, Pujong is like the stronghold of the SLPP. And the bridge leading there was like a death trap. So I took photographs of this horrible condition of the bridge. And when I came back to Freetown, I was then the awareness science publisher, I ran a story on that two days in a row, non-stop, criticizing Tijan Kaba. That have been an No, I'm giving you an example. Okay. I, I don't want to give you an example. I want to, let me land. And I ran this story. And people started saying, Tijan Kaba will ever encourage you again after this kind of article. And one of the reasons why I think Tijan Kaba's place in history is secured is his tolerance. People were so shocked, they were attacking on that. The second one, the second criticism that I remember that was very, very strong was the younger issue. At the time, my editor was Sayu Kamara. And we ran a front page article against Tijan Kaba, very heated uh, criticism of Tijan Kaba and our young time about the way he was handling the younger issue. And the story goes on and on and on and on. There were so much criticisms of Tijan Kaba in awareness times. All right, Doc. Um, let's talk about your relationship with the Ernest by Chroma led APC uh, administration generally. Uh, you had a difficult start, it has also been said, and adjusting to the laws of the SLPP and the early Ernest by Chroma um, um, administration. Well, before we go to the uh, Ernest by Chroma administration, let's go back to the year 2000. In the year 2000, as I told you, my political journey was APC. I've always been APC, apart from the brief moment when Cornelius Dobo and Makale, you know, it was interesting. Um, the people who really convinced me to uh, lead the YPP, when the 2002 elections ended, because I led the YPP into the 2002 elections, I didn't contest. I was 29, I was 30 years old by the time of the elections. I was 29 when they first contacted me. I was 30 years old by the time of the elections. 
30 years old, I cannot contest as a presidential candidate, but I basically was the party leader. I led the party into the elections. After the elections um, had ended, the party basically, the message was there that young people can really organize themselves and go for political power, which is what I, which is what really moved me. Because at that time, I was also an internet consultant to President Yaya Jame of the Gambia. So not only your basanjo.com website, but even Yaya Jame's very first website was done by me. At Senegal, the then president who was in Senegal, I also worked on his website. I worked on a lot of top West African people's uh, websites. So I was in Gambia, and I was inspired by the youthful leader, because at that time, 